What's up, guys? Brett Okamoto from ESPN, joined today by Bellator light heavyweight Corey Anderson. I think that's probably the first time he's been introduced as a Bellator light heavyweight. And we'll get to that and we'll get to all kinds of things because, Corey, I think the last time we saw you was in February at a UFC main event. And uh, it seems like a, a lot has happened to you since then. So first off, how are you? How's the family? How's everything? Uh, how is everything now that we're in, uh, we're in August? I mean, everything is good for me. Everything is good for the family. Um, Career-wise, everything is great now. So, you know, can't complain. I'm pretty happy where I am right now in life and career-wise and with my family and everything. So I'm excited. Well, let's take me back to February. So you fight Jan Blockowitz in New Mexico. And uh, like I said, I don't think a lot of people heard from you, you know, immediately after that. And then all of a sudden you come out and you share this, this, uh, this post. It looks like something pretty uh, significant happened to you in February. So take me back to the night of the fight and just sort of tell me what happened from there. Um, the night of the fight, uh, I went out there with my, I had the title eliminated fight, the chance to get that fight. Uh, I dropped the ball, can't point fingers at anybody. I went out there, underestimated Jan and kind of felt like, I dominate this guy the first time with only six fights underneath my belt. There's nothing he can do with me now with 18 fights. So I kind of went out there and just didn't respect his power. I was like, I'm just going to stand in front of him. You know, if he comes in too close, I'm going to take him down and ground and pound him and work where he worked on him. But I didn't get that far. I didn't respect my opponent, and I paid for it. Just like anything else in life, you got to respect the motorcycles, the horses, whatever it is you're doing, you got to respect it because they, they'll show you why if you didn't. And then, uh, yeah, I did the commission check in the back after. And I remember we were sitting back there. Like I told DC, I've been hanging out with DC for two weeks of his camp. And we are talking about being knocked out or whatnot. And I was saying, like, I remember everything up until getting hit. And I remember waking up and going over to my family in the fence, telling them, keep your hands up. Everything is fine. Head up. And uh, I remember going to the back. The commissioner was like, all right, we're going to go in his room. I had a little cut over my eyebrow. And we're going to sit you up. And then we go from there. Like, all right, so I do that, and me and my coach are just sitting there looking. They're like, what are you waiting for? Like, that's it? Go, yeah, you're good to go. Hmm. And I'm looking like, usually they do like a check, like make sure the light in your eyes, how many fingers, where you are. They didn't do anything else. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I go about my business, live my life. I was like, all right, so I'm going to go back, chill. I was in, had to go to Arizona, had my best friend's wedding, um, had a couple business meetings for my other ventures out there in Phoenix. and. I get off the plane. When I get home, I go back to the woods. Like I said, I'm always outdoors. I go in the woods. I'm walking around for like four or five hours with my dog scouting. I get back to the truck. I go next door to my buddy's house, and he's got a gravel driveway. And I'm literally walking up to his truck talking. And I remember right before I get to his truck, I get like a little light head spin. And I went to reach for his truck to catch myself, and I never made it. I woke up to the ambulance and everybody around me, and they was dabbing my face. And telling me like uh, I had convulsed coming back and whatnot. And everybody was freaked out. My wife was there. And I'm like, I was fine at that point. I was like, I'm cool. Just let me go home. Right. But um, ambulance suggested that we went to the ER. They did a bunch of tests. And it just ended up being like a long five months with COVID slowing things down, of course. But it was a long five months of uh, having to look deep inside myself to figure out if this is really what I want to do still because I don't have a family. And uh, it kind of made me realize my self-worth, which is kind of what brought me to this Bellator situation. Huh. So so when you left, first of all, when the commission kind of just, just got you out of there, I mean, did, did you ever consider, like, um, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Maybe I'll go get checked out? Or, or was it just like you felt fine so, so you didn't really think that was necessary? I'm the type of person if I feel fine, I don't think it's necessary. You know, it's like if you don't feel symptoms, why am I going to go in? I didn't have any headaches. Like the whole week I was in Arizona, I drove probably, I drove from Phoenix up to Tucson. It was like a two-hour job, driving back and forth to different meetings, business ventures. And the whole time I'm driving, I felt fine. I'm there with my business partner. We laughing, we talking. Mm -hmm. I felt normal. So in my mind, it was really no point to go get checked out, you know, but um. I will say I wasn't staying hydrated like I probably should have taken brain damage like that. You should definitely be drinking a lot of water and at night putting an ice pack or something in your head. But instead, I was drinking a lot of alcohol and eating junk. So, I mean, that could have helped as well. But yeah, did you get back to training at all, or were you were you were you taking time away from the gym that whole time? Before I dropped it, a whole five months. Um, well, before you dropped, like after, immediately after the fight, were you staying out of the gym at least? 
Well, yeah, I was going to at least take some time off. I always do that. Uh, just got, like, stuff in the house. I was going to hit the bag, and I would go to, like, jujitsu and watch and, mm-hmm. like, do ground and pound and stuff like that. After all my knockouts, I at least take some time off from getting touched physically in the head to keep the brain from shaking anymore. Mm-hmm. But uh, at the time, it was literally, like, four or five days after the fight when it all happened. So you go to the hospital, and they and they tell you what exactly? Like – it was the effects of a concussion from the fight, but why did you have that response that you had? And then what was, what was the process of recovery like in those five months? I mean, to be honest, they never gave me a legit, like certified answer of what exactly it was. But uh, when I first went in, it was the same doctor I seen before I fought Johnny Walker in New York. I had to go do there to get heart clearance because I have an athletic heart or my when you do EKG, my heart rhythm is slow. It shows like it sometimes it seems like it's not beating, but it is. So you got to go do an echogram and all this extra stuff. Mm-hmm. And when I saw him, when I saw it was him, I knew for sure he was going to want to do a bunch of tests because he knew my history. And of course he did. And one of them was a, a blood test. I can't remember what it's called, the troponins. The troponins is something was high or low. And what he was trying to say is that mean the – the reason for you fainting wasn't because of your head, it was because of your heart. Mm. And that opened up a whole new can of worms. So I was in the hospital. Where I went in on Friday. I left Wednesday. And they had to do all these different tests while I was there. Then they discharged me and sent me to another place to do like a heart catheter. It's putting like a, a little thing through my wrist all the way up into my heart and checked the valves. I did heart MRIs. I literally did every test you can do for the heart and everything came back negative. And, uh, Every other doctor I saw other than that doctor, it was like, from all the tests, the only thing we see is like, you got something with a concussion. You know, you got knocked out. We've all seen the fight. We all know who you are. We've seen that you got hit, knocked out, and then on the way down, you got hit in the back of the head and the extra punches on the ground. It's just lack of water and all that stuff. And like you said, and then the concussion, you just happen to go out. You're overexerting yourself too soon. But that one doctor that, uh, called that said it was heart he opened up his whole new can of worms sent my mri and stuff to somebody else it was a long process like i said i ended up going to do this thing where they had like electrocute my heart try to make my heart stop and then they pumped me like an adrenaline to make my heart race it was it was scary scary it was painful but i look back now and i'm glad it's all over and done with go to your bed sorry talking to my dog yeah that's right uh Man, I mean, I, I don't think we need to get into the whole conversation about the, the healthcare system in the United States, but just, you know, you're, you're in a sport in which you kind of rely on, on the health system, you know, in between these fights and around these fights. I mean, have, for you to go to multiple doctors and then not to be able to tell you that something was going on with your heart and then it ends up that you need, you had multiple procedures on it, right? Yeah. So has that kind of changed anything about how you're going to handle like the health side of, of your career moving forward? Yeah, I mean, that's, like I said, that's kind of where we got into the Bellator situation. It's kind of how Bellator came into the issue. It was, one, the healthcare system, like I kept telling my wife, the only reason we kept going back, well, after the doctor put a hold on my career, he literally put a lock on my medicals where I couldn't do anything until I got that final EP test where they shot because they wanted to put this, this recorder, it's like this big, they put in your skin that keeps track of your heart. And then, but then they said I wouldn't be able to fight with that. And I know I didn't need that because I knew I had an athletic heart. But my wife and I had a wife and a kid. I got to think about them. And my wife wanted me to do all these tests and make sure everything is done properly before we go back. But like I kept telling her the whole time, the doctor's going to always say something until they find something. If there's nothing there, they're going to keep doing something to get the money coming until they find something, until there is no more options, which is literally what they did. They did literally when I left that doctor, so there's literally no more tests that we can do, and everything came back negative. There's nothing wrong with you. It comes out you just had a concussion. And that's five months later after I told them, like, I just have a concussion. <laughs> but they just want to do all these just in case. And it was, like I said, it was crazy. But at the same time, I'm glad it's over with. I'm glad to know I'm healthy and I got a family. And if I want to move forward with this sport, I need to know with this sport, know that I don't have risk of going out there and my heart stopping in the middle of a fight. Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, have they given you like a completely clean bill of health or do you have to go get this like like 
checked up occasionally just to make sure you know, it's everything was done. They wrote off the doctor came and last time I saw the doctor, he literally came and said, Hi, Mr. Anson, congratulations. I can finally let you go back to beating people up. There's mm -hmm. nothing else that we can do. You're safe to go. So what, what was the closest you came during all of this to, to just retiring saying it's not worth it. I got to look after my health. I, I got to walk away from the sport. I mean, it was never in my mind that I was going to retire from it, but I was comfortable in my mind that if it came, I had a conversation with my wife and my family. If it came down to it, where it was something health wise that we couldn't fight, like I was okay with having to walk away. You know, I've been here, I did my time, I did my seven years, whatever it is I've accomplished, I've accomplished those things, and I'm happy with where I've been. And uh, now it's time to go do my other business ventures, you know, and I'm always hustling. I got other things going at all times. So it wasn't like we're going to be sitting on our hands wondering what's next. Mm. So you kind of walked us through this whole situation now. So then how does Bellator come in? Because you also, in your post, you thanked the UFC. You said that they, they helped you get through the, the medical situation. So this isn't a situation that we normally see where the UFC just, just you know, agrees to release some, somebody and then second, they're, they're signed with Bellator. So, so how did all of that happen? Uh, like it was literally, like you just snapped your finger, it was literally that fast. Like, uh, we were good. They literally, after I came out the procedure, I literally get rolled into the hospital room, my waiting room. I turn my phone on, I get a contract from the UFC. I guess they got either a notification or email that I was cleared to fight again and instantly had about lined up Nikita Krylov, ready to go. I was like, all right. But then my manager was like, before we do anything, make sure you're 100% healthy. I was like, okay, we're going to do that. And uh -huh. by the time we was waiting, I agreed to the fight. And then also I get a call that – In the hospital, you agreed to a fight. Yeah. Like, they, it was literally – they sent it to me while I was doing the procedure. As soon as my phone come on, come on I get an email. Like, wow. like that's crazy. But, um, but that, uh, that goes into when we get to the Bellator situation also. So, you know, I'm just on I'm five months. I'm ready to get back. I say, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Then the key to get hurt and they start doing the same things they did in the past. You know, they're offering these different fights, but none of the fights made sense for the money I was making. You know, mm -hmm. I'm number four in the world and I was making money like it was my fourth fight in the UFC. And, you know, it's like, okay, like I said, while well, I'm sitting in that hospital, I think about I got a family. At first, when I used to fight, I used to tell people, I don't care about the money. I'm fighting to be the best. I want to be the best. That's it. I don't need the money. But then after hanging out with DC, he broke something to me. He said it one day. He was like, you know how you used to say you don't fight for money? He's like, yeah. He's like, when's the last time you've been in a street fight? I said, I don't since I've been fighting. He said, why not? Like, because you don't get, you don't fight for free, right? He said, you fight for what you fight to pay for your family. At the end of the day, that's what makes sense. You need to take care of your family. Don't be out here fighting just to get a world title because at the end of the day, that's not going to take care of your family and everything. Mm -hmm. And, like, that made sense. And then Eddie Alvarez told me the same thing. My coaches said the same thing. My manager was saying the same thing. And uh, when the conversation came up with just another fight, and I asked him, like, see if we can get a little bit more money. And if I'm going to keep doing this, I got to get my work. I can't be going out there risking end up in the hospital for my family through what we've been through for these little peanuts. And at the end of the day, my wife still got to work and everything to make things in, make ends meet. And they wouldn't, but I'm like, no, and like, I only got two fights left on my contract. So we'd be renegotiating anyway. But even then they was like, no, no, he's fighting for that or nothing. Mm -hmm. And then literally, I guess they got into this, my manager got into this whole ordeal with them about my health and whatever was going on. And like I said, I mean, he said, if we can get more money, would you want to? I was like, sure. And, uh, like, all right, ask for my release. Literally, and that's another reason that made me so quick to accept it. When it's like, all right, we're releasing. The fact that they said okay in, like, literally 20 seconds. I was on the phone with my manager. He said, I'll call you right back. I hung up. My phone was called right back. Like, they released They said they release you. And it was the fact that, well, I was just got out of a procedure, five months. Like I said, I ain't got no anger towards the UFC, I understand. But this is where I knew my worth was to them. Like I said, I respect everything they did for my seven years, giving me the platform to get where I am. But if I've been in this hospital situation for five months and I literally come out of this procedure that I could have died on the table doing, but they emailed me during the procedure to give me a fight contract, one, they don't really care about my health. Hmm. And the fact that if I tell them all the stuff I've been through, I just want a little bit more money, and they say no and release me within 20 seconds, in my mind, it was like they really don't want me here no more. Hmm. You know, they got all these new guys. 
they trying to bring something else. Like Dana say all the time, we're looking for the next Ronda Rousey, the next Conor McGregor. The people are going to be exciting. And we all know that I'm not that exciting guy. I'm a boy. I'm a, not a boy. I go out there and I fight like a martial artist. I use what I'm good at and dominate with it. And it was kind of like if I can get paid to do what I do more somewhere else and take care of my family and set us up to a real well off, it's time to make that move. Mm. And Bellator, they offer was, it was money you get when you're number four in the world. Wow. And 100% where it was like, all right, uh, my wife was very upset. It was hard for me to sign that contract. It was, hard, it was hard for me to say, all right, accept the release because I started my career in the UFC. But at this point in time, I have to take care of my family. If I want to let my family grow and my money to grow, I can't just keep fighting for nothing just to be the champ. I got to fight to take care of my family. Yeah. And that's how we ended up in Bellator. How did you know that offer was going to be there? What did was it that like a leap of faith? Like like I'm gonna I'm gonna release and I don't know where I'm going. Or did you have some kind of inclination that maybe? You no, know, I talked to Eddie Alvarez before, and he just said, "Man, you got to do what's right for you. If you go ahead." It was this was back last year with the Johnny Walker fight because we had a contract dispute then, and he told me, <clears throat> "You just get released." And like I said, you're not gonna pay me my worth after the Johnny Walker fight. I said, "Release me." I talked to Eddie. He was like, if they release, you take it. But they wouldn't. Then. Right then, they fought and said, we don't want to release them. We're going to keep them. Okay. But this time, it was like, they released me. And literally, it happened so fast. We got the release. Ali made a call. He called me back and said, we, we in it. You want it or not? And he sent me a contract and instantly I hit him back, like, sign that. Email me that. We're going to do it. Because <laughs> I was just going to hang for a while. Eddie Alvarez told me. Just play the game, man. Just play the free agent game and wait. You're going to get offers because you're still the top guy in the world. But it just came so fast. He was like, hey, that right there, now that I'll fight for. That's willing to put my life on the line for. That I can take care of my family. If something happened with this, with the money we got and this extra, my family will be taken care of. That's crazy that they, because I mean, your story is not completely unique and that, you know, guys get, get to a point in their contract where they want to make more money, but it's not every day the UFC just releases them like that. So you have like, why were you unique, Corey? Like, why, why do you think your situation was different? I give you a couple of reasons. One, because I've always been, I've been, Corey marches to his own drum. I've been that way my whole life. Like, I never, you might want me to do something. You might tell me I need to say this or do this. But if I don't feel it, I don't feel it. You know, before they wanted me to take fights, they wanted me to do this and do that. And I always fall like, nah, I don't feel it's worth it. Nah, I don't feel that. I ain't going to do it. So I was always that type, like, they can't just call and say, all right, we want you to fight this guy. Now, before, when I first got in the UFC, I wanted to make a name. I used to say yes to every fight just so I could get ranked quick. Within my first year in the UFC, I was ranked in the top 10. After that, it was time to slow the roll. I didn't have to do that anymore. Now I started picking up, picking and choosing, but they was calling me to fight guys when I was ranked, what, before I fought Johnny Walker? Or no, before the Johnny Walker fight, because he was ranked like 13 or 14, and I was 8 or 7 or something. I said, that makes no sense. Then they hit me with like three guys that weren't even ranked, or like one or two fights. Like, why would I fight those guys? And then that kind of... Started off first, our little, our head butts in, mm. and I beat Johnny Walker. Then I went on the interviews and was saying, F the UFC, you know, F Dana White and all that. I spoke out about him. I'm sure they still had some hard feelings about that as well. And then to top it off, like my brother said, he thinks it's because I blew the whistle on the commission. When I said that and did that post about the commission, he, we feel like that was kind of backlash. Like they kind of wanted me to just go out there, take a fight, and then if I lose with everything, they can say, all right, you're done. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I feel like the fact that I just offered, just released me, like, all right, that gives through this headache even faster. Get rid of it. Huh. So now it does sound like you're in a, in a better, much better spot. You're much more happy with, with Bellator. Um, let's get to that. When, when are we going to see you in the cage again? What, what, uh, what have your, your preparations been like? Have you been in camp or whatever? Are you looking at, I mean, first thing, when you sign with Bellator, everybody's saying, well, there's a, there's a contender for, for Ryan Bader to fight. I mean, could that be your first fight or you think you'll get something else in, in, in between? I mean, it could be. If it is, if it's Ryan Bader, the, uh, I can't remember the kid's name that he's fighting. If it's a winner of that, I'm, I'm with fine. it. If it's yeah. Phil Davis, I'm with it. If it's Yoda Machida, I'm with it. Like I said, I'm at the point now where – they're paying me to fight, you know, with this kind of money. It's kind of hard to say no to whoever they give you. But as for like before, it was kind of like, okay, that's not worth, it's calculated risk. 
the risk you wanted me to take wasn't calculated for what you put on the contract. So it was like, why would I take that? As for this one, now it's kind of like, all right, this is calculated risk. This is what they're paying you for. They're paying you to go out there to fight. You might win, you might lose. But it's, at this point, I'm ready for whoever. I know what I'm capable of, especially after two weeks with D.C. It's like I'm out there going him, the baddest man on the planet. Well, former, but he's about to get it back. Baddest man on the planet, and we going at it. And he even told me after, it was like, Corey, there's no reason why you shouldn't be the UFC world champ. Mm-hmm. That you do everything I do. And you're a little faster because you're lighter than me. It's like, you're good, dude. Like, you just got to be patient. You put things together, there's no – you shouldn't have a problem with anybody. Yeah. And, you know, I had that mindset, ready to go out there and show it in the UFC. But guess what? Now I get to show it in Bellator. So mm-hmm. whoever wanted, it, I'm ready. I want to ask you a couple more questions about DC because obviously, like you said, he's got a big fight coming up. But the last thing about your situation is, do you feel like you you made any mistakes along the way to like that got you to the point that you were at? Or like, because like you said that DC gave you good advice. What advice would you give to, to some of the fighters who are just coming into the UFC so that they maybe don't reach a, a similar spot that you found yourself in? Don't make yourself just a yes man. You know, I did that before. Like every time they called me, it was always yes, yes. I took a fight on a week and a half notice in Brazil, you know, when I was, what, my seventh or eighth fight. You know, it's good to stay ready. But the problem was every time they called me before, I think before I got to the Glover or uh, before I got to the TV fight, I probably took six or seven short notice fights just because they kept calling me with opportunities. And I would say, yeah, all right, okay, yeah, okay. And then, like, Eddie Alvarez said it to me. He said, you at the point now that they know if they call you, you're always going to say yeah. So the fact that you said no, that kind of rubs them the wrong way. It's like you made yourself to the point where it's kind of hard to negotiate because before you just say yes all the time. Mm-hmm. Now that you're trying to think as a businessman, it's kind of like they're not used to that because usually you just took it. Mm-hmm. So I would just tell the guys when you come in, just, I mean, listen to your coaches. And my coaches and my managers and everybody said it before. Like, yo, it's no point in taking this fight, man. Just chill, get better, blah, blah, blah. I was like, nah, I can do it. And, you know, I won those fights, but still, it was, I didn't have to. You know, like the Glover Check Share fight, that was a different fight. Rank number three, that's an opportunity you take. But I was really taking them against anybody, wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations on getting in a better spot, man. Looking forward to seeing you in Bellator. And before we let you go, what was that experience like with DC going out there? And uh, I mean, how did it come up? And then, and then what were you doing out there when you were spending time with him in San Jose? I mean, that experience was, that was career changing. I think, like I was telling him, I feel every person that they, the finals was the one that came to my mind. But every time somebody goes on like a little skid or, they like on the down slope or people say they're on the down slope and all of a sudden they come back up and get a title fight and they win a title or something. It's from after they went and trained with somebody who was a world champion caliber and they see things in themselves or see things they need to change. Mm. I told them I feel this is that thing I needed, you know, to come out here with a guy who was two belt champion, 205 and heavyweight, who's fought the champion of my belt and who knows what he's bringing to the table, who knows what I was going to go after, who I was going after. He can literally tell me in my face after sparring, like, bro, there's no reason why you shouldn't be the champ. Mm-hmm. He can tell me every day, like, dude, you're good. Like, I'm telling you right now, you're good. You can be the champ. And that's like to beat John Jones. Just to hear that, like I said, my coach has said it. I've always believed it. My wife always believed it. But when you can go there and change up your game, when you're going with a world caliber guy and make him actually believe, mm-hmm. that's when you know it's like, all right, that's all I needed. Now I know what I need to do different. I need to be a little bit more patient, be a little bit smarter, and go out here and get it done. Just go out here and win. That's all that matters. Yeah. Last question. Give us some insight. And uh, I'll say that this is just your opinion. You know, it doesn't have to be anything he necessarily told you or whatnot. Did you get the sense that you were with a guy who's about to retire? Do you think that this is DC's last fight? He wants to. Like I said, he got a family. His wife got another kid on the way. He kept saying, I'm 42 with another kid. I'm like, what am I thinking? You know, he said he, he wants to. Like I said, he can't compete forever. But at the same time, you can hear him talking. Like, you can hear in his voice. Like, the competition, the competitiveness in his voice, it wasn't always kind of, like, subtle. Like, he was okay with the retirement. Yeah. There's a chance he might. But, you know, like, I told him, like, bro, if you got your mind set, you're already talking about retirement. Just go. You yeah. know, there's no point to keep fighting. You got all these other endeavors going. You got the beautiful family. You got everything laid out for you. 
Yeah. Get your retirement and go, man. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for sharing uh, what happened to you over the last five months, man. We appreciate the time. And uh, I'm sure we'll, a lot of people will be looking at that Ryan Bader, uh, Vadim Nemkov fight a little bit differently on August 21st now that they know that you're in the division. So look forward to seeing what you do in Bellator, man. Thank you, Britt. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.